If you would, turn to your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to be looking again at trials. We've been talking about trials this month. The first chapter of James generally is about uh, trials and overcoming trials. We often say to ourselves, if we had a little money, maybe things would be better. I always like that. People will tell me that too. They say, man, if I only had a little bit of extra money, I know what I'd do. I'd pay all my debts off. I'd never have another debt as long as I live. Uh, and then I talk to folks that have got a little money and they say, huh, you're just beginning if you've got, <laughs> if you've got any money because you're going to have more debt. It happens. No matter who we are, no matter how far along we are, no matter what part of the world we're in, people are asking for more and more and more because they think that a little bit of wealth might be able to help with the trials and sufferings. I think this point of view is one reason why the health and wealth gospel goes so well in other countries and in America. The health and wealth gospel basically says that if you believe in God and you give God your everything and you just plant a little seed money here and a little seed money there and you give to this, you give to this preacher and that preacher and this and that, then you're going to be blessed. You're going to, you're going to have that seed's going to take off and you're going to go and you're going to be wealthy beyond your imagination. Don't fall for that. Okay? Don't do it. Just don't fall for it. If the preacher starts begging for money. And he's begging for money because he wants something. He says is anything like seed money or anything like that. Sometimes the best thing to do is look at what he believes doctrinally. Because if he can't back it up in the Bible, don't be given to him. What I'm going to be talking about today is something that's the opposite. The direct opposite of the health and wealth gospel. And it's found in nowhere else than James. Right here in verses 9 through 12. James chapter 1 verses 9 through 12. You know, Tarpon and I were talking the other day and one of the things we talked about was a song that we remember very well. Farther Along. Y'all remember that song? Farther Along? I remember that song quite well. Farther Along. Tempted and tried were often made wonder. Why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us. Never molested, though in the wrong. When death has taken our loved ones, leaving our home so lonely and drear, then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year. Now there is a verse in there that you might not see in your songbooks. It goes like it's tempted and tried, how often we question why we must suffer year after year. Being accused by those of our loved ones, even though we've walked in God's holy fear. You know, I think that oftentimes we think that Christianity is a, an easy way to be comforted. It's an easy crutch. Don't have to worry a lot. You ain't got a lot of stress on your life. In America, the Christian church is very easy. All you got to do is just attend service once a week and you're pretty good. We don't think of it as a life. The problem is, James is saying right here, if you aren't living the life, you might be in trouble. As we've read in verses 1 through 8, our trials are going to come. First lesson we learned, trials are going to come no matter what. You are going to be living and breathing in this life. There are going to be days when things go wrong and trials happen. Second thing we learned was who we needed to give those trials to. We needed to give them completely to God. Not just half-heartedly. Not sitting on a fence, unable to move, but give them completely to God and allow Him to do the work. Allow Him to get us through those trials. Because if we allow him to go through the trials with us, he's been through those trials as Jesus Christ. He's seen this. He knows this. He knows our pain. He knows our suffering. He will meet our needs. Today I want us to look at something else though. So many times verses 9 through 11 are lifted out of context. 
and meant to go and say, well, this is just about the brevity of life. I'm here to tell you today, verse 12 continues the discussion of trials that we've been talking about all this time. So when you put it all together, James 1, 9 through 11 is not a random teaching about rich or poor or dying. It's about dealing with the problems that we face in trials. We observe the worldly rich doing well in this life while we suffer trials. How can we have steadfastness in trials when we see a wicked world prospering year after year? More so now than ever. It gets right in our face sometimes, don't it? James is going to address this issue. As we read in, in uh, James chapter 1, verse 9 through 12, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in a high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because, like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with scorching wind and withers the grass. And the flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too are rich, is the rich man in the midst of the pursuits of his pursuits and he will fade away blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the lord has promised to those who love him now let's take this piece by piece let's start with verse 9 here the lowly brother appears to be talked about, talking about a Christian who is crushed by trials. He's weak in despair and he's suffering from what he is presently going through. Further, James is contrasting wealth. In verse 10, he speaks of the rich. Therefore, the lowly brother is not simply lowly because of life circumstances, but also has less material wealth. Thus, a lot of translations are right when they say humble circumstances to try to camp, capture that James is not only referring to material possession, but is also talking about weak, insignificant life circumstances. Have you ever been so mad at the things kind of going the way they go? You get upset about your job, you get upset about your position in life, you wish you had more, you wish you had something better. That happens. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's human to do that. The problem is when we dwell on it. When we dwell on being more and being successful. Let me put it this way to you. You may not know it, but you're amongst some of the richest people in the world. Fiscally, financially speaking. Did you know that? Do you appreciate that? I'm not talking about people with high dollar checkbooks or people with big houses or anything like that. I'm talking about somebody like myself that lives in a little 1,200, a little 1200 square foot house that don't make a whole lot of money each year. I can go over to any country in Africa and visit with the people that are in tribes in Kenya, in Uganda, in other places, in other parts of equatorial Africa, in the Congo, all those areas through there, I can go and visit those folks. And if I showed them a picture of my house, they would think I was living like a rich man. Do you know why? Because it isn't about how much wealth you have. It's about the perception of that person that you're talking to and their circumstances. Yeah, I can go up and look at some folks here and say, well, let's compare checkbooks. I don't do that. I don't dare do that. And I don't ever ask anybody to do that. And I would say if anybody asks you to do that, you tell them to back up <laughs> because that ain't cool. And that ain't right, especially when the church does it. There are churches that will do that too. They'll go and say, well, let's see what your checkbook is so we know how much to tithe. Ain't none of your business what I have in my checkbook. Ain't my business what's in my checkbook. Ain't your business. Ain't your business. Ain't my business in the church to know what's in your checkbook. 
God knows your heart by what you're giving and what you're doing. God knows that. I don't have to know that. The elders don't have to know that. The deacons don't have to know that. Nobody has to know that. But there are people that sure think they do have to have no way to do that. Let me tell you now. This is how God's word gets twisted. When people start thinking they have the right idea and start doing things the wrong way. God isn't going to yell at you because you don't give 10%. He wants you to give your very best. Remember the widow's might. You remember her? You remember the widow? We talked about her before. We talked about how all these rich guys were in line. They were giving. They were giving. They were putting money in the tithing box. And, and here comes this sweet little old lady. And Jesus notices her. And she has two pennies. And she puts those two pennies in that box. And he looks at the disciples. And he says, hey, guys, you check that out. You see what she just did? She gave from her poverty, not from her wealth. She gave everything she had in order for others to be blessed. It doesn't matter what you make. It doesn't matter what you have. You have got to be willing to give your all to God. That doesn't mean you go and give everything you have to God. As far as finances and money, you still got to pay bills. You still got to take care of your family. Yes. But what you need to do is you need to redirect your attention to what you're giving to. What are you investing in the future? Now, get ready for a Father's Day sermon because it's coming. What are you willing to invest in? I ask that to a lot of people. And sometimes they have different things go through their minds when I say the word invest. What would you invest your time in? What would you invest your effort in? What would you invest your money in? And they tell me the same thing. Well, I invest my, you know, I want to be able to give my kids something and leave them something for when I do go, they'll be well taken care of. Okay, what do you want to leave them? Well, I want to leave them some money. I want to leave them some stocks. I'm going to leave them houses. I'm going to leave them this. I'm going to leave them that. Dot, 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 dot. All this material stuff. Well, there's a problem there. James instructs the Christian of humble circumstances to boast. In his exaltation. It means boast through your trials. Now we're not to think that James is saying Christians need to brag about the trials. Bragging's a negative force. But what we need to be able to do is to glorify in our exalting. That means glorify in Christ. That means glorify in the name of Jesus. That means glorify and be lifted up in the name of Jesus. Do you know what we are supposed to be giving our kids? We are not to be giving our kids money and wealth and a, a prosperous life and all this stuff because that stuff's secondary. What you need to be giving your kids today is far more important and far more priceless than any wealth you can give them in this world. Give your kids Jesus. Teach your kids about Jesus. Let them see Jesus in you. Let them experience Christ in you. Spend quality time with your babies. Growing them in the nurturing love of Christ. Forget about the money for a minute. Forget about stocks. Forget about houses. Forget about the wealth of this world. And put it to the side. And remember that eternity is exactly that. Eternal. I want my children, my son, my two daughters to know that I love them more than anything. And that my goal in this life is to get them to heaven. And I want you to be able to do the same with your babies. And dads, we are responsible for that. Our babies need to know that their daddies love Jesus. What are they seeing in us? What are they hearing in us? How are we able to go and testify to Christ when we go before Him in the judgment? When we stand before Him, when we stand before the Lord, and we go and Jesus says, what kind of life did you live for me? What will we say? Listen, my beloved brethren, 
Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, which has promised, been promised to those who love him, according to James chapter 2, verse 5? If we've been promised heaven, how do we get there? Exactly what we've been talking about. You overcome the obstacles in this life. You, you overcome the adversities in this life. You overcome the trials in this life through God. Not through money. Not through finances. Not through being wealthy. Because James is going to get into what being wealthy does. And I'm not talking about rich Christian people. Okay? There's a difference here. Now, automatically, there are going to be people at home. Oh, you're going to talk. Oh, you're going hypocritical now. You're going to go and blast the rich people outside of Christ, not the rich people in Christ. If somebody is truly in Christ and they have money, then they know and they seek to do what, with that money what needs to be done with that money. They're not going to go and they're not going to question. They're not going to go and yell and scream and fuss and fight and fume over giving that to the poor and giving that to the needy and giving that to people that are missionaries overseas and giving that to the church and giving that to people that need it. Letting it be distributed to those who need it. They're going to be there to help those that are sick. Barnabas did that. Barnabas sold his land in Acts chapter 4, it says. He, sold, he was a rich man. He was wealthy. And he had money. And what did he do with that money? He gave it to the church. He was a Christian man. Doesn't mean you have to be willing to go and take care, and not take care of your family and not take care of your finances. But what it means is what are you doing with those finances? You see, the rich people, the people of the world, the rich people of the world don't give two rips about God. And they sure don't want to give God any of that glory. So they make up terms like self-made man. I don't have to go and trust in God. I take care of myself. I am my own man. I have my own money. God didn't give me this. That's where you're wrong. You've been blessed. Now what are you doing with it? What are you doing with the blessing that God gives you? How are you living with the blessing God gives you? And trust me, when it comes to wealth, if it's one thing I've learned, wealth turns less into a blessing and more into a responsibility the more you have. The reason being is because, just like Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of the needle or a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to get into the gate of heaven. Why? Because rich men are afraid to let go. They've got security. Their money secures them. What happens when the money isn't worth anything? What happens if something happens to the economy? There goes the money. Now, a loaf of bread costs $100. What then? Where's your security? The people who know God have security in God. The people who care about God, those that are going to be tried and tried and tried again and go through those trials and rely on God, hands in, hands on, over the top 100% every moment of every day, they are going to go and they're going to prosper. Good's going to happen. And they're going to be able not just to take care of themselves, but to take care of others too. James says, with a bit of sarcasm and irony, the rich should boast in his the rich will boast in his humiliation. Before we can move on, it is safe to determine though that we are talking about those that are not rich in Christ. Those that are rich in the world. There are a lot of people in this world right now that are living Christ, living Christian lives that are got money, got wealth, and they take care of things. Does that mean that there aren't Christians or people that claim to be Christians that are in the church that are wealthy people that are looking to God no I am not I'm saying that too as well there are rich people in the church today that are not living Christian lives 
There are rich in the church that are not living Christian lives, and they need to. Just as there are poor people that need to. And there are more people that are rich outside the doors of the church that need to have that attention addressed to them as well. And this is who I think James is talking to. The rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. He doesn't say that the riches will fade away in the pursuits. He says that just as the Christians who have no wealth will go on to glory, the rich man will just fade away. So this is why I think that James is contrasting the Christian who suffers his trials with the wealthy of the world. Therefore, James is offering consolation to the Christians in humble circumstances. The rich are well off and perhaps their wealth causes them to avoid some of the suffering and trials of this life. But they will receive their own humiliation. The Christians must not look at the worldly rich longing for that and think that they will be better off. Unless you would like to take delight in humiliation, then go ahead, go down that road of riches and wealth. Go ahead and be the double-minded person whose loyalties are divided between God and riches. But know this. The rich person who passes away is like the grass or like the flower. Again, Understand that James does not say that riches pass away like the flower or the grass. No, this is true and is made point in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. James points that the rich person will pass away like a flower of the grass. It is not going to go well for the rich person. Just as the grass withers, just as the flower falls, just as the beauty perishes under the scorching heat of the sun. So also will the rich person wither and fall in the midst of his pursuits. That is why I'm asking you fathers today. What are your pursuits? It is why I'm also going to turn and look to the mothers as well. What are your pursuits? Because there are just as many women that are guilty of pursuing money as it is men these days. If your pursuit is about money or gain or wealth or anything as such, perhaps it's time to redirect your focus on what's important. I would love my kids to have money to be able to pay their bills. I would love to be able to leave them property that they can sell and be able to use whatever they deem fit. But I also know one thing about that. That is temporary stuff. It all goes away. Do you think that little house I live in in a hundred years is going to be livable? Unless it gets some really heavy duty work done to it? And redoing? No. No. It's temporary. It's temporary. Folks, I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about stuff that lasts forever. I'm talking about stuff that is going to be in glory. Riches that are in heaven. I'm talking about the mansion over the hillside. I'm talking about the things that we need to be focusing in on. But yet everybody seems to want to focus in on the material because, oh heaven's sake, our world, our kids, they need to know what it is to have more than we did. I would love my kids to have more than I did. In fact, I want them to. But I'm going to tell you this. That is not what I number, my number one goal to teach them is. My number one goal is to teach my babies. That there is a God in heaven that loves them. Cares for them. That will provide for them. Even when it looks like the chips are down. When we give our trials to him. And we grow in his wisdom. Just like we've been talking about the last three weeks. We will overcome. Those that don't. Those that are so busy in life. 
and run around like a bunch of bees, running around for a queen like, queen, like ants running around. You ever seen ants running around your kitchen or around a picnic table or around wherever? You see those ants? only thing they're doing is what their boss is telling them to do, what the queen's telling them to do. And that's sometimes what we do. Now, I hear people already, well, I don't have a boss. I'm my own boss. I can do what I want to do. Well, then, boss, what are you telling yourself to do? You've got to get your focus on. Focus on what is important. Not on the temporary stuff. Those temporary things are going to fail. Every single time. They will fail. The rich are engaged in their schedules and their activities. And sometimes they completely neglect God. Even in the church, we have folks that do that. And it don't even have to be the rich to do that. It's sometimes people think that are rich in time and energy and strength. And they waste their time, energy, and strength on the goals of this world. They'd rather go on a boat out in the water on the lake. Or they would rather go and, and, and play, a, play a basketball game or a baseball game on a Sunday instead of assembling together in like Christian faith. Why? Because I want what's best for my kids, dang it. That's what I hear a lot. If you want what's best for your kids, you'll give them Jesus. You will teach them Jesus. And more importantly, you will live for Jesus. Because our kids deserve the best. And Jesus is the best. You cannot give your children any better gift than Jesus. And that means that in that we remain steadfast under trial. James concludes his whole talk about being rich and and the rich not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they're going to get their just desserts. He goes and he says. Right at the very end. He says. You guys. If you remain steadfast. If you remain true under trial. Endure the trials and prevail. He goes and he returns to the opening topic. That he never has strayed away from. Since the beginning of the chapter. He goes back and he says. Look. God's made the promise to you. Are you going to live for him? Or are you going to live for this world? He that goes and lives for God has been given the promise of eternal life and eternal hope. Dear Christian, for God made the promise if we are steadfast under trial. When we stand the test, we receive the crown of life. The Christian has a promise from God to hold on to an anchor through the trials. You will be victorious. James uses the term to describe the inevitable state of the man who does not give up when confronted with trying circumstances, but remains strong in faith and devotion to God. The Greek word there. Translated, stood the, stood the test. Describes the successful testing of precious metals and coins. Probably the easiest way to demonstrate that is to take a coin. You ever see the guys that used to take the coins? They go and they bite the coin and they bend it. See if they could bend it. Seen guys do that on TV? People that try to bend the coins and all that. They're testing to see if it's real. If it's genuine. What James is talking about is something even better than that. Not just with coins. But when you're tempering metal for war. You see. A man who does metallurgy. And wants to make a good sword. Knows that you can't make a good sword with a bunch of junk in that sword. Some people will pour all sorts of different steels together and. All sorts of different materials together and make a mishmash of a sword. But the minute it hits something pure, it breaks in two because it's brittle. It hasn't been tested. It hasn't been purified. It hasn't gone through the test. But when a steelsmith, when somebody that is in 
to dealing with metal and dealing with purifying the metal goes and heats it up and purifies it and separates all that bad from it, takes it and burns it up. See, those are the trials we go through. The trials is that heating process. God goes and he reaches into us during that heating process and he takes out all that unclean, that unclean stuff. He goes and purifies it and purifies it and purifies it. It's not just one time he does it. It's several times of refining. The steel becomes pure and becomes adequate to be a weapon. Why do you think you pay more money for something that is pure steel or a pure metal blade? If you're going and you if you were living in the times when swords were being sold, you're going to spend a lot of money for a solid steel sword. Why? Because those swords are purified. They don't have any junk in them. They don't have any material composite left in them. And when you hit somebody else's blade that's of a lesser grade, that blade of theirs is going to break right in two. That's what the world has, you see. The world is coming at us with wooden swords. They're coming at us with these impure, imperfect swords. They're saying, my money will take care of me. My life is guaranteed only for today. You only live once. They're coming at us with everything they can. To say this life is temporary. We are here as Christians with purified steel in our hearts. And as weapons, we hold the purified word of God. And we stand firm on the defense, ready to go. So when people do come up to us and say, well, what is it that makes your life so different than the world? You can tell them, I've been through the trials. I've been through the tests. And God has put me through the fire. And has refined me. And made me stronger. And I have stood the test time and time and time again. But you have to be willing to let God put you through that. You have to go to God when you go through that. When you're going through those fires. When you're going through those trials. When you're going through the pain. When you're going through the suffering. When you're going through times that are tough. And when you haven't got money. Or if you haven't got a job. Or if you haven't got health. Or if you haven't got anything. You give God that time. And you allow Him to do the work in you. Without question, without fear, without shudder, without thinking, oh, no, I, I can't do that. I can do this on my own. I've got this. Stop it. Sometimes you don't have it. And sometimes you need to give it to God. That way you can gain steadfastness, strength through the testing, through the trials. Steadfastness under trials results in approval. And approval results in the crown of life. But that means you've got to put your heart into it. Do you have faith to move mountains like that? A lot of people think that all they got to do is just maybe go check out and see if the grass is greener on the other side. I'm here to tell you today the grass is not always greener on the other side. It's better to be lowly and humble in circumstances now than to be exalted later and exalted later than to be rich now and humiliated later on when going before God. Take delight in the knowledge that we are being made into complete Christians lacking nothing. But it is a process. Just like we've been going through in this sermon, it's a process. A lot of people have said, you know, you pre I had some folks write me the other day. I had a couple of guys that said, you know, these sermons sound almost exactly alike. Well, it's all on the same topic. And it's all in the same area. And they're like, well, why would you do that? That'll get boring to people. And I'm like, it doesn't matter what somebody thinks of it. All this connects together. This is God's word. 
We put two and two together. We put it together. If people are listening to God's word, it's not going to be a matter of it's boring or it's exciting. It's going to be this is God's word, this is how it is, and this is what we need to do. But too many times people are wanting to get excited. Sometimes just what you need to do is sit down and be still and know who God is. And that he is in charge. And understand that in order to be a complete Christian, we need to be into his word and remain steadfast under trials. Don't ever think that you've got it better and that you're going to do, that, you, you, that you're, you've got all that money and you've got all that time, you've got all that whatever it is. Don't you dare take it for granted. Use it for what God wants you to use it for. God has promised a reward for your endurance. Whether you're rich or you're poor. Doesn't matter how much money you've got. Not to God. Doesn't matter how much, how much material wealth you have. Not to God. This world is temporary, guys. This world is temporary. Give our children what they need. The, the, the sparks that are eternal. Those embers that burn inside of us of Christian living. Give those to them. Help them to see that we are living a Christian life. And that living a Christian life reaps its own rewards. It may not be that we're going to be seven figure people living in mansions here on earth but we've got something far greater waiting for us in eternity what if you're wrong preacher what if you're wrong I hear that a lot too God's word says that he has promised that to us God's not a liar And if I am wrong, what have I lost? I've lost nothing and gained everything and taught that to my kids. That my kids would be able to look and be able to train up others to believe that others are just as important and need to be encouraged just as much as those wealthy people around them. Yeah. That's not failing. That's improving. And we all need improving. That's what God does. This morning, if you think God is needing to improve you a little bit, He can do it. This morning, if you've got a decision in your heart, now it's time to make it. Come know Jesus this morning. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. Be willing to repent. Give your life up for Christ. Live fully for him. Confess Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't hold back. Don't wait. Don't delay. You are not guaranteed the next five minutes of your life just like I'm not. I want to be able to help as many people as I can get to heaven. And I know you do too. If you've got somebody close to you, share the good news with them. If they don't know it. We want all people to get to heaven. All people. Jesus will return for his people and his church. Will you be in that number? I don't want people to fade like the grass and the flowers. I want people to get to know Jesus. This morning, if you've got a decision to make, Now it's time to make it.